pull this up. There it is. All right, can everybody see the screen now? Got a thumbs up. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, so today we're, we're talking about the lymphatic system. Um, as far as this portion on the practical, there's only, I think, one model. They might have maybe two. So we call the lymphatic man model. Just make sure you're working on that. I do know there's a couple of issues with, with uh, a couple of the questions in there. So when you find that, just email me so I can go fix it. <clears throat> I got a couple of them already, but I think there's some more that I missed. So just work on those, it'll be fine. There's, there's not a whole lot as far as model identification is concerned on the practical from this last practical that we have to have. So we're starting the material for the last practical today, um, which obviously is a lymphatic system. Now. I did notice that they have, you know, several different slides for the tissues and organs we have to identify, but they all have some basic features in common, and I'll mention some of that as we go through when I get to them. So first, let's go over what the lymphatic system is, what its roles and functions are, and what it's composed of. And then we'll start getting into uh, the specific organs and cells that are involved in immunity um, and the other functions of the uh, lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system basically has three functions in our body. It is involved in what is called fluid recovery right here. Fluid recovery is the process whereby excess leaked out fluid and proteins from the cardiovascular system specifically from capillaries and small venules, we get this, at least in lecture we covered it, capillary exchange. So this fluid leaks out of the, of the blood vessels and enters a tissue around all the cells. Now a large amount of that fluid and leaked out substances go back into the blood, but there is a fairly large volume that does not enter the blood. And so wherever we have a blood capillary, there are some special little lymphatic capillaries. And those lymphatic capillaries are very permeable for fluid movement. So those lymphatic capillaries basically take in any excess fluid or leaked out proteins and it enters the lymphatic system. So that fluid that it is accepting and recovering from the tissues then becomes what we call lymph, all right? And we'll talk about that in a second. So that's the draining excess fluid from tissues. We call that fluid recovery. The lymphatic system is composed of lymphocytes. Those are the, the cells involved in immunity. So the lymphatic system is involved in carrying out immune responses. And then the lymphatic system basically absorbs many, not all, but many of our dietary fats that we consume. So we just finished the digestive system and the enzymes that break down lipids and proteins and all of that. The majority of all of our nutrients that we absorb occurs in the small intestine, as you know, through the, through the lining, the absorptive cells, but most of the fats and broken down lipids don't get into the blood first. They get into the lymphatic system first. So for that reason, the fluid that is in the lymphatic system is kind of creamy colored because it's loaded down with these dietary fats, right? So these are the three main functions. Um, the lymphatic system is made of three basic structures. Three, well, I should say three basic things. Number one, the lymphatic system is made of specialized organs and tissues that are made predominantly from reticular connective tissue. So these are modified reticular connective tissue organs. Um, as far as the protein fibers are concerned, they're loaded down with reticular fibers, there's some other ones. And then there's a whole bunch of lymphocytes and a couple of organs have you know, some other cells in it that I'll, I'll mention in a minute. So we have these organs or structures, things that you are somewhat familiar with, lymph nodes, everybody's heard of that. Uh, the spleen in the body, 
tonsils. I'm sure you heard of your tonsils. So these organs and structures are part of the lymphatic system. Now interconnecting all of the different structures of the lymphatic system are lymphatic vessels. So just like we have cardiovascular system vessels, capillaries being very small, then we have you know veins and we have the arteries, stuff we covered already. The lymphatic system also has vessels. And typically wherever we have cardiovascular system vessels in the body, you also have lymphatic vessels. So basically vascular tissues are also supplied by lymphatic vessels. Now, the lymphatic vessels have different branches. Some are small, like what we call a lacteal. You identify that on a model in a digestive system. A lacteal is a basically a blind-ended lymphatic capillary. Uh, they merge together to form larger lymphatic vessels. And those lymphatic vessels through the body have different names. You're going to be identifying some of these off of one of those models. But there's two main ducts that ultimately is draining the lymph, the fluid of the lymphatic system from all over the body. Lymph drains back into the blood in your neck region. So there's a right and left lymphatic duct. The left lymphatic duct is also called the thoracic duct. Now these ducts actually physically join to the veins in our neck that you learned about specifically at the junction of the jugular and the subclavian veins. So right around the brachiocephalic vein on either side, the right one and the left one is where the right and left lymphatic duct physically joins. So all of this excess fluid and absorbed dietary fats drain through all these lymphatic vessels, ultimately to make their way to the right and left lymphatic duct in your thoracic cavity. And these ducts have the job of draining lymph back into the blood. So ultimately, all fluids in the body that you could ever learn and think about come from a filtration of blood somewhere. So we filtered the blood out somewhere in a tissue. Some of that excess fluid went into a lymphatic duct uh, vessel, and then that lymph was drained back to the blood way up in your neck. So that's the flow of lymph in a nutshell, all from the body. Now, the right lymphatic duct only drains lymph from your right arm, your upper right chest, and the right side of your head. That's it. So all the lymph just from your right arm, your right shoulder, and upper right chest, and the right side of your head drains back into the blood through the right lymphatic duct. That means the left lymphatic duct has the job, or thoracic duct has the job, of draining lymph from all other parts of the body. So from your feet and your legs, your lower abdomen, your left arm, shoulder, you know, the left upper side of your chest and left side of your head, all that lymph drains back into the blood via the left lymphatic duct. So we have a fluid called lymph. We have lymphatic vessels. Some of them are called trunks and some of the, the two big ones are called ducts. And then we have specialized organs and tissues. So let's talk about those specialized organs and tissues for a second. The specialized lymphatic tissues or organs can be grouped into two principal categories. Some of them are called primary lymphatic organs and the other ones are called lymphat uh, secondary lymphatic organs. We also have dispersed lymphatic tissue. Whether it's called a tissue or organ, I'm not concentrating too much on that. But the point is, whatever we call the lymphatic tissue or organ is loaded down with lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes are the workers of the lymphatic system for our immune response, this uh, immune function up here for the lymphatic system. So we have something called diffuse lymphatic tissues. Diffuse just means that the lymphatic tissue is not encapsulated with a connective tissue capsule. There's no capsule surrounding that group of cells in that tissue. So we just call it diffuse. A more generic name and how it's spread around the body is called 
mucus associated lymphatic tissue or malt. So this tissue is actually found just under the mucous membranes in all the mucous membranes in the body. So for instance, below the lining of your stomach, below the lining of the small intestine, so uh, in the below the lining of the urinary tract, the reproductive tract, wherever you have a hollow tube system, below that epithelial lining are scattered lymphocytes. So that if there's ever a compromised epithelial barrier, meaning like in your stomach, you might get an ulcer. The epithelial lining of the stomach is deteriorated and bacteria and other pathogens might try and go through that hole which is called a portal of entry, by the way. So the first thing they come in contact with, if they go through an opening in the epithelial lining, are your lymphocytes. And so your lymphocytes will be exposed to the pathogen and they start to become activated against it. And that's when we start our immune responses. So this is just called diffuse lymphatic tissue up here. The primary and secondary lymphatic organs are classified as that because of this. This is how simple it is. There's only two primary lymphatic organs. Really one of them is more of a tissue, but only two, red bone marrow and the thymus gland. So what classifies them as primary? Well, primary lymphatic organs or tissues is where the lymphocytes are actually produced, where they're made and or where they mature to become what we call immunocompetent. So what I mean to say by that is obviously where the blood cells are made is your red bone marrow. You should know that already. So all blood cells are made in red bone marrow, which is found in our bones. So lymphocytes are blood cells. So red bone marrow where they're made has to be considered a primary lymphatic tissue. So the problem is this though. When the lymphocytes are produced, they're not produced in a mature form. They're not capable of carrying out immune responses yet. So you could think of them like an immature cell. So not only is red bone marrow considered to be a primary lymphatic tissue because that's where the lymphocytes are produced, but it's also the site where the B lymphocytes actually mature. Now the T lymphocytes don't mature there. The T lymphocytes, once they're produced, get out into circulation and then they go to the thymus gland. So the thymus gland is located superior uh, and just uh, superior and anterior to your heart, the thoracic cavity. And the thymus gland is considered to be a primary lymphatic organ because that is the gland where the T lymphocytes mature, they then differentiate to become specific populations of T cells and they become immunocompetent. So immunocompetency basically is the ability for the T cells and B cells for that matter to be able to carry out immune responses effectively. So the thymus gland and red bone marrow is where the, the red bone marrow is where the cells are produced. The red bone marrow is also where the B cells mature. The T cells are produced in red bone marrow, but they don't mature until they get to the thymus gland. Now, all of the other organs that are part of the lymphatic system are called secondary lymphatic organs. And secondary lymphatic organs are things like your tonsils, which I'll talk about at the end of the packet. Um, the, the lymph nodes, which are studded along the lengths of lymphatic vessels, and your spleen. So those structures are called secondary lymphatic organs because the, the lymphocytes are not made there. They don't mature there, but they carry out immune responses there. They become activated against a pathogen and begin to carry out immune responses in those areas. So the secondary lymphatic organs and tissues are where the lymphocytes become activated against a particular pathogen. That's the key. All right, so let's talk about the thymus gland. 
the thymus gland, you can see the picture I put up here. This was a slide I, I use in, in lab. I took pictures of it. And of course, they may have updated pictures that you can find a billion different pictures online. Um, but there's something that is uh, very obvious when you look at any slide of a thymus gland. Number one, the thymus gland is encapsulated. That means it has a connective tissue capsule around it. Those are collagen fibers that surrounds the gland. So often on some pictures, you might not see the, the fibers separated like this. It might be close to it, but it's encapsulated. But right away, the identifying character here is this. If you look on the low power magnification, you see all these little white lines everywhere. Now it looks like it's empty space, but what these are, these are called trabeculae. The trabeculae are invaginations of the capsule that dive into the gland and kind of forms these little lobules. These are called thymic lobules. It's partially lobulated. So if we look at it in large view of it, a higher magnification, what you can see in the lobule is a, a circular structure in there and then an outer structure. Now the colors might not be exactly the same, but you'll be able to see these, these structures. So within a lobule, you have an outer region, which is always called the cortex and an inner region called the medulla, right? Now the thymus glands job in our body is to allow for the maturation and differentiation of the T lymphocytes. So let's talk about the T cells a little bit. The T, well, let me do this first because I passed it up. The B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes are produced in red bone marrow. The B lymphocytes mature into immunocompetent cells in red bone marrow, and the B cells then get out into circulation. And when that happens, they find their way to a home in the lymphatic system. They find their way to the spleen, to the tonsils, to your lymph nodes in our body. When the B lymphocyte is exposed to a pathogen that it can recognize, it becomes activated. An activated B cell is called a plasma cell. Plasma cells are the cells that produce antibodies. So antibodies are secreted proteins that are involved in a specific type of immunity. And the type of an immune response that involves antibodies is just simply called antibody mediated immunity or AMI. So what cell is involved in AMI? Well, B cells becoming activated the plasma cells and the plasma cells job once it's activated is to produce antibodies against the, that particular pathogen that activated it. So for that reason, B cells are our antibody mediated immune response system cell. So that's what carries out antibody mediated immunity, the B lymphocytes. Now the T cells, a little bit, well, a lot different. They still carry out an immune response, but in a totally different way than the B cells. So when the T cells are produced in red bone marrow, they're immature when they when they're reach the blood. So they're produced in red bone marrow, they get into the blood, but they're immature, they can't do their job yet. So those immature T cells are called pre-T cells. They're called pre-Ts. Those pre-T cells migrate in the blood to your thymus gland. And the thymus gland basically is a testing ground for allowing your pre-T cells to gain the ability to mount an immune response appropriately in our body. They also gain different types of receptors in their membrane as they are maturing. And depending on what type of receptor the pre-T cells produce, they become a particular subpopulation of a T cell. So what are the main, well, there's a few of them, a couple of main populations of T cells. Well, there's a group called the CD8 cells, or we just say T8. So CD8 or T8 and CD4 or T4 cells. 
These are two main populations of T cells. Now, why do we call them CD8 or CD4? Well, depending on if this pre-T cell, when it's maturing in the thymus gland, produces a receptor called a CD8 receptor, it then becomes a CD8 cell or a T8. If the pre-T cell produces a CD4 receptor, it's a CD4 cell or a T4 cell. So what do these two cells do anyway, their main job? Well, the CD8 cells or T8 cells, when they become activated out in the body against a pathogen, they turn into a cell called a cytotoxic killer T cell. So that's what an activated T8 cell is, a cytotoxic killer. So these cytotoxic killer activated T8 cells are activated against a particular pathogen and their whole job thereafter, once they're activated, is to go around the body and physically kill off the pathogens through a process referred to as cell-mediated immunity or the cell-mediated immune response, which is called CMI. So there is actually two branches of your immune system. There's an antibody-mediated branch and there's a cell-mediated immunity branch. So the cell-mediated immunity branch is accomplished by activated T8 cells into cytotoxic killers that then go around the body and perform cell to cell combat. So those cytotoxic killers physically go around and kill off bad cells in our body. Activated B cells don't do the majority of their job by killing off cells, they do their job by producing antibodies. So those are the two arms of our immune response. Now, what are the CD4 cells? Well, the CD4 cells, also called T4s, when they are activated, they become something called a helper T cell. So the T4 cells are called helper T cells. And those helper T cells have the job of helping in the activation of CD8 cells and B lymphocytes. So the helper T cell, which is a CD4 or T4 cell, basically is responsible for helping in the activation of our B lymphocytes so we can perform antibody mediated immunity. And they're involved in helping activate T8 cells to the cytotoxic killers so we can perform cell mediated immunity. So here's the thing, we have those two arms of our immune responses, but CD4 or T4 cells are right in the middle. And unfortunately, the virus that causes AIDS, which is HIV, infects this cell. This is the cell, or these are the cells that are infected with the hum uh, human immunodeficiency syndrome virus, HIV, right here. So what that does when someone has a HIV infection and they're in an outbreak, their T4 cell count goes down drastically. All their T4 cells get killed. And without T4 cells, your immune system is totally suppressed. Your AMI doesn't work, your CMI doesn't work. And for that reason, people with AIDS typically die from secondary infections that we would normally would be able to fight off. They, would, they acquire rare cancers that we normally don't get in a person that has an act, a, a well-functioning and active immune system. So HIV basically suppresses everyone, their immune response, because it kills off the T8, uh, T4 cells. And for that reason, the disease is called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It's called immunodeficiency because the HIV virus knocks out your immune response. And now you can't kill off anything in your body. All right, so those are the cells.
of our immune system. And we're going to talk about these a little bit more in a second. All right. So let's move down to the spleen. The spleen is the largest, single largest mass of lymphatic tissue in our body. It is encapsulated, so basically we can call it an organ. The spleen is located in the left lateral, upper right, uh, left, I'm sorry, the left lateral, upper left quadrant of your abdominal cavity. You can see here a model that you, you looked at already for the digestive system. Here's the pancreas and the duodenum. Over there at the tail of the pa uh, a pancreas is where the spleen's at. Your spleen is housed and just covered up by the last two pair of ribs on your left side of your upper uh, left quadrant in your abdominal cavity. The spleen is encapsulated with a capsule, connective tissue capsule up here. And if we look at uh, several different histological sections of the spleen, you can identify two basic types of tissue in the, in the spleen. The majority of all the tissue in the spleen is referred to as red pulp, right here, red pulp. But on this particular type of stain that I took a picture of this slide, the darker area, I don't know if you can tell, but there's darker purple area right there, darker purple area right here and there. And if we look at it in large, you can see where it's a little bit more purple. That darker area is called white pulp. So we have what's called red pulp and we have white pulp. The red pulp is predominantly composed of red blood cells, platelets, but they do have some scattered uh, leukocytes in there, lymphocytes. And they're sectioned around little structures called the cords of Billroth or Billroth cords. And those are just areas in the red pulp where we have collections of all of these cells. So our spleen actually has two main functions in the adult. Now in a fetus, there's a third function, but as an adult, we, our spleen is involved in helping get rid of bacteria or old or dead or dying red blood cells and platelets through phagocytosis. There's macrophages all in, in those tissues that can perform phagocytosis to help get rid of these old cells that are our own or any bacteria that may be there. The spleen also stores about a third of the body's platelets for us. So if we are heavily bleeding or hemorrhaging, our spleen can eject out some platelets for us and allow us to help clot our blood a little bit more efficiently. And at least in the fetus growing in utero, the spleen is involved in blood cell production or hemopoiesis. Now under extreme conditions, extreme anema, anemia in the adult, the spleen can start producing some red blood cells, but that's a very minor role. So we always say that this is a role only in the fetus. But what is the white pulp then? Well, the white pulp is this darker area, at least on this type of stain. Whether it's an inverse stain or not, you'll always see one area that's lighter and one area that's darker when you go to look at it on the slide. Where you see just a little bit of an area that's different, that's always the white pulp, and where you see the majority of the area, where, whether it's darker or lighter, the majority of the area that's always the same is the red pulp. So what you're really looking for is the discoloration, whether it's darker or lighter, the smaller areas are called the white pulp. So what's in the white pulp? Well, a whole bunch of lymphocytes, T cells, B cells we just talked about, macrophages. There are some red cells in there and some platelets, but it's loaded down with these leukocytes, the white blood cells. And if you remember, white blood cells all have nuclei and then they start staying purple. So at least in this particular stain, you can see it, this area right here is more purple than the outskirts over here, which is a little, you know, redder or pink or whatever color that is. That's because this area is loaded down with the white blood cells that have nuclei in them. Another identifying character in the spleen that you'll have to identify is a central artery. Now, I know you can't tell, but in the spleen, this white pulp actually forms a cylinder around a central artery. So technically, if this was a complete section, a cross section, we might see this purple area go all the way around the central artery right there. But the angle of the section that this is in, we only see a part of it. But 
The white pulp basically encircles what's called a central artery. And that's what these two little things are. All right, so that's the spleen. You're gonna have to identify a spleen just like the other tissues, distinguish between white pulp and red pulp where the central artery is. They may also even ask you to, to identify a splenic vein. I should have put a label on here. So this area right here, this is a collapsed vein right there. This is a, uh, one of the uh, veins in the spleen. So when you see, and you can see it on the low magnification, you can still see a couple of them over here. So that's a, another vein and you can tell it's a vein. I don't know if I told you that before between an artery and a vein because veins are very thin walled. The wall is not very thick. And typically on section, they collapse in on themselves. So that's why this is kind of collapsing in and it's not a full circle. So that would, that's a, a splenic vein right there if they make you identify that. All right, let's talk about the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are what I like to refer to as little filters that are stationed along the lengths of all the, the lymphatic vessels in the body. So if there's any pathogens that are getting into the lymph and thus flowing with lymph along the lymphatic system in the vessels, sooner or later, those pathogens are going to be introduced to our lymphocytes, B cells and T cells, in lymph nodes. So here's a lymph node. You can see these little circular structures in here and the lymph node is encapsulated. You can't tell too much. Now, this was an older slide, but there's connective tissue fibers out here, collagen fibers, so it is encapsulated. These little circular structures are called lymphatic nodules or follicles. And I think the word that they use on some of those assignments in lab is follicle. But I just graded uh, those other practicals from that mini session, and I gave people credit for nodule because that's a term I used in my, in my packet. But these lymphatic nodules are stationed along the perimeter of a lymph node. Some are scattered just into the lymph node, and a lymph node is sectioned into what we call a cortex, which is the outer part, and then the inner part is called the medulla. There's also, this gets a little more specific. There's an outer cortex and an inner cortex. I'm not getting into all of that right now. If you look at your textbook, you'll see some of that in there, but we're not gonna identify that here. But nonetheless, the identifying character of a lymph node relative to say a tonsil that you're gonna have to identify, because they all have these little circles in them. The majority of these nodules or lymphatic follicles are found along the, the majority of them are found along the perimeter in the cortex of the lymph node. So what are these nodules or follicles? These are collections of our T cells and B cells. The very middle of this lymphatic nodule is called a germinal center. And the germinal center is loaded down with B lymphocytes. They got some scattered T cells in there, but it's predominantly B cells. And whenever lymph flows through the lymph node, if there's bacteria in there or cells infected with a virus, and they come in contact with these B cells and the T cells that are scattered in there, those cells become activated against that particular pathogen. And for since they become activated against that particular pathogen, and they're gonna carry out a very specific immune response. For that reason, your immune response is also referred to as specific resistance to disease. So the B lymphocytes become activated in here, and they begin into plasma cells, and they begin to secrete antibodies. Now, I know you can't see it, but a lymph node is shaped, shaped somewhat like a kidney bean. So there is an indented area, although we can't see that. And there's a convex area on the other end of it. On the convex area of a lymph node, there's several different lymphatic vessels enter the lymph node through which lymph is gonna pass directly from the cortex through the medulla and, th and pass all of these cells 
it's going to pass through the lymph node. There's always two lymphatic vessels that leave the lymph node. And so the ones that enter the lymph node are called afferent vessels. The ones that leave a lymph node are called efferent lymphatic vessels. So there's a one-way flow of lymph through a lymph node. And so we can always then expose our T cells and B cells to the components that are in the lymph. So many pathogens in our body make their way around our body in the lymphatic system. In fact, that's how cancer spread in our body, if you didn't know that. Cancers that spread, uh, which are called metastatic cancers, those cancer cells spread through your lymphatic system. And that's why doctors go take biopsies of lymph nodes in and around an area where a tumor would be to see if the tumor spread. So that's a, that's a day for another discussion. But nonetheless, so our lymph nodes are loaded down with these little follicles or nodules, our T cells, B cells, they got some macrophages in there. And this is where they become activated. Now, typically when a B cell is activated, the majority of them stay within the structure where they're activated and they just keep pumping out the antibodies. Some of them can migrate around the body though, but the majority of the plasma cells stay where they are and they dump out antibodies. The T cells though, when they become activated in whatever organ or tissue they're in, when they're activated, they typically then scavenge around your body. They go all over your body and they basically go around your body and hunt down the pathogen that they were activated against. So for that reason, cell-mediated immunity involving activated T8 cells or cytotoxic killers, they perform cell-to-cell -cell combat. And I like to use the analogy of the army men that's on the ground, boots on the ground at war, and they physically are on the ground and they go and perform, you know, try and kill off the bad guys in war. That's what our T cells are, our T8 cells. Now, where are the lymph nodes located? You're gonna to have to identify these on that model, the lymphatic man model. I don't have a picture of it in here, but I do have it in the Quizlet. So an easy way to identify your lymph nodes, and I didn't put every single name of them here, just the generics, but the lymph nodes that are found in your neck are just called cervical lymph nodes. They typically take on the name of the part of the body where they're at, or they take on the name of some structures where they're located. So the, the lymph nodes in your neck are called cervical and your armpits are called axillary. There are some scattered through your thoracic cavity. Generically, they would be just be called thoracic lymph nodes, but we can further specify what they're called as well. Like uh, the bronchial bronchomediastinal lymph nodes, whatnot, but they're all in your thoracic cavity. Same thing with your abdominal lymph nodes. They take on different names. Where are they? Are they by the intestine? They're called the intestinal lymph nodes. Are they by the mesenteric membranes that you identified, which are called mesenteric lymph nodes, so forth and so on. Or are they in the iliac region, the iliac lymph nodes? So you're gonna have to identify them. For this test, just know the generic name and the part of the body where they're located. That's it, all right, for the physiology. Now, also in the physiology test, I'm going to ask you some a little bit more specifics about the T cells. So let's talk about them a little bit more. First of all, the T8 cells are called T8 cells because they contain a CD8 receptor. When they're activated against a pathogen, they become the cytotoxic killer T cell which is the cell that goes around the body to eradicate the pathogen that's infecting you. But what do these receptors do anyway? And how does this T cell know not to go and kill off your own cells in your body? That would be bad, right? We don't want our immune system cells attacking our own cells because if they do, guess what you have? An autoimmune disorder. And we don't want that. So if we backtrack a little bit, all the T8 cells and T4 cells come from a cell called a pre-T cell. Those pre-T cells mature in a thymus gland. And that's a generic way of saying it. What happens in there anyway? Well, they obviously gain the ability to develop and produce a certain type of receptor group. And there's hundreds of different receptors. 
These are just the two that make them this type of group. But the other thing that happens to the pre-T cells and thymus gland is they learn the difference between what is you from what is not you. Or in other words, they learn to tell the difference between your own cells and a foreign cell or foreign antigen. So antigens are any structure that can cause our immune system cells to mount a response against it. Generically, they're just called antigens. We have antigens in our own cells, but our antigens would be referred to as a self antigen. Our self antigens. We do not want our T cells and or B cells to become activated against a self antigen. And so that's what the pre T cells are being tested for in the thymus gland in part. They're tested to see if they can become reactive against your own antigens or self antigens. So if they can become activated against your self antigen, you know what happens to them in the thymus gland? They're killed. They're destroyed. We don't want those cells, our T cells, going out into our body that react against our own self antigens. So part of the testing that occurs in the thymus gland is to make sure that the T cells don't become activated against a self antigen. That process is called self recognition. So our T cells have to be able to self recognize first. That's their number one job. They have to be able to recognize the difference between a self antigen and a foreign antigen, like a bacteria really the molecules on its membrane. But so virally infected cells look different than your own cells. Bacteria look different. Even your own cells that become cancerous look different at the surface. So our T cells and B cells have to be able to recognize those differences. So that's all called self recognition. We want them to become activated against anything that looks different in our body and eradicate it. That's part of the immune response. So what do the T8 cells, specifically their CD8 cells, have to do with anything? Well, the CD8 cells have the job of binding to a cellular marker, a protein, if you will, that's on the surface of every cell in your body except for mature red blood cells and B lymphocytes and other cells called antigen presenting cells. But every other cell in your body contain what we call major histocompatibility protein one or MHC one. So the CD eight receptors on the T eight cells have the job of binding to the MHC one protein on the surface of the cells in the body. Basically it anchors the cells together because part of the activation process, which we're not gonna do in here, but we'll do in lecture, is the cells have to actually physically bond, to bind together. It's called docking. They have to dock together, like a boat would, would uh, you know, pull up to a dock and, and tie off at a dock. Well, these cells have to dock to your cells in order to start the recognition process of self and foreign antigens. And that process can take anywhere up to 30 minutes for this activation process to happen and then begin and then happen. So the CD8 receptors bind to MHC1s on all cells of the body except for mature red blood cells, B lymphocytes, and other cells called antigen presenting cells, which include a cell you already know, macrophages, and special cells called dendritic cells because those cells don't have MHC1s. These cells have MHC2 proteins, which leads me into the T4 cell or the helper T cell. So the T4 cells are called T4s because the pre-T cells in the thymus gland produce CD4 receptors.
So what do the CD4 receptors do? Well, they bind to a cellular marker at the surface of B cells and antigen presenting cells, uh, which are called APCs for short, by the way, antigen presenting cells, APCs. So those CD4 receptors bind to an MHC2 protein. So the MHC2 receptors are on antigen presenting cells. The MHC1s are on every other cell in your body. So what are these MHCs anyway? Well, these are what I typically call in general biology when we cover uh, the, the membranes in general biology. I talk about receptors in there. You may or may not remember it, depending on who you took, you may not have talked about it. But our cells in our body have cellular markers that basically tells all of our lymphocytes that those cells are ours and not to attack it. Those are our self markers or our self antigens. And I typically call them in general biology to make it easy, our cellular fingerprints. Like everybody has their own fingerprint, you have your own cellular markers. Yours are yours, different from mine, different from everybody's. That's why someone that receives a heart transplant, they get somebody else's heart. All of those cells are not theirs. So their immune system cells want to go and attack it. So to prevent that, that person that received an organ from somebody else has to be put on immunosuppressive medication for the rest of their life. <clears throat> or they're going to or their body may reject the organ. And where does that organ rejection come from? Wow, lo and behold, it comes from cell-mediated immunity. Because this T8 cells, when they're activated, the cytotoxic killers, see all of those heart cells, which aren't that person's cells, as foreign, and they try to kill it. So they have to be put on immunosuppressive medication. So that's what the CD8 and the CD4 receptors do. They bind to these major histocompatibility proteins. So I want you to know that. Now, again, B cells, uh, when they're activated, turn into plasma cells, which produce antibodies. And for that reason, they carry out antibody-mediated immunity. All right, the last thing we really have to talk about today are your tonsils. So I want you to look at this picture for a second. Um, students often confuse this and vice versa with the lymph node because you see all these little circles everywhere again. So if I go back up to the lymph node real quick, here's those little circles everywhere again. But look where, and those are the nodules of follicles, look where they're located. The majority of all of these in the lymph node are found in the cortex, the outer or inner cortex of the lymph node. Some can reach down towards the medulla a little bit, right? But the majority of them are all along the perimeter. But look at the, th uh, look at the tonsil. <clears throat> the tonsils have scattered lymphatic nodules everywhere. They're all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason to it. So let me tell you what your tonsils are. Basically, you have three major groups of tonsils. The tonsils, as you may know, are found somewhere in and around your throat, your pharynx, right? They're in the back of your throat. Well, there are three major groups. One of them is a single tonsil. That's called your pharyngeal tonsil. And often, you know, the adenoid. People say they, uh-oh, did I lose y'all? Can y'all still hear me? Yes. Okay, good, because it disappeared over there. At any rate, uh, the pharyngeal tonsils found uh, in the superior portion at, uh, by the nasopharynx and just posterior to it. So the nasopharynx is at the back of the nasal cavity, but it's a superior part of the pharynx. So back there is a large pharyngeal tonsil. It's a single tonsil. The, if you still have your tonsils, if you open your mouth and you still have the ones that are in there that you can see, some people get them out. The ones you get out the, are called the palatine tonsils. They're paired. So I still have mine. So if I open my mouth and look in the mirror, I can see the two paired palatine tonsils back there. We also have a pair of lingual tonsils at the dorsum, the base of the tongue. Typically there's two, but there may be a, another nodule or two down there. I, I, what I mean to say by that is not a nodule like this, but another group 
but typically we have a pair of them down there. So these make up what we call the tonsils, which are loaded down with lymphatic nodules or follicles that are filled with B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Again, that's what these nodules are. These lymphatic nodules are where we have the highest concentration of T cells and B cells. Now, what's found along, the, and, and tonsils are what we call partially encapsulated. So some very introductory level books will call them diffuse. That's not technically correct all the way. They are somewhat diffuse, meaning that the, ca the capsule does not encirculate the whole organ or tissue, but it is encapsulated somewhat along the back perimeter of it. So partially diffused, partially encapsulated, but nonetheless, that's, that's neither here nor there for this discussion. What is important here is this, at least in this picture, and I don't know if they're gonna make you identify this, but I used to make people identify it when we were in lab, physically in lab. I took a section of a tonsil and you see these little indentations in it. These indentations are where, when you swallow food and drink, those food molecules and particles and drink kind of go and wash along the surface of the tonsil in what's called a tonsillar crypt. So if there's any pathogens in the food or drink that you're consuming, maybe bacteria or something, they would come into contact with this surface, which then become introduced to your T cells and B cells. So when you get a sore throat and your tonsils swell up and they hurt, you know, they're basic, and your lymph nodes for that matter. When, if you have a sore throat and you feel a nodge, a hard nodule is kind of solid in your neck, that's a swollen lymph node because part of the immune response is inflammation. These organs fill up with fluid. They, they become filled with fluid while they're attacking and becoming and attacking the pathogens. So they hurt. Some people have recurring sore throats, so they have to go get their tonsil taken out. You don't technically need them. They do mount immune responses for us, but you don't really need it if you have a problem with them because it can cause, the actual immune response can cause more of a headache than eradicating the path, pathogen to begin with anyway. Because to tell you the truth, if you get a bacterial infection causing a, a sore throat, uh, like a strep, streptococcal bacteria, or uh, like what people call strep throat and whatnot, you have to go get on an antibiotic anyway to kill it your immune response is not gonna be sufficient to eradicate streptococcus pyogenes. It's not gonna happen. So you go take an antibiotic for it. So you technically don't need them and you just get them, you get them taken out because it, it hurts when you have a sore throat, especially if it's, if it's recurring. So um, you're gonna to have to be able to identify at least the tonsils. They, they might make you identify the nodule or follicle. I, I, I don't remember, I have to go back and look. So just do again, all your pre and post assignments. Um, for the physiology test, just know their name, uh, like the pharyngeal tonsils in the roof of the nasopharynx, uh, of the pharynx, the roof of the pharynx uh, at the nasopharynx. The palatine tonsils are on in the back and on either side. They're laterally located at the back of your pharynx. And the lingual tonsils are located at the dorsum or the base of the tongue. Now, this is a picture of a, a lymphatic uh, vessel a small vessel, and you can see that it basically resembles a vein. Lymphatic vessels resemble veins because they have the little valves in them, one-way valves. Just, Leslie, you had a, a question? Okay. Um, they have one-way valves in them, and they their structure is just like a vein. There's an endothelial lining. You can't see it, but they don't have a lot of stuff around it. They're actually very thin-walled vessels, all right? All right, so that's about it from the chapter. Oh, I need to show you one more thing. So let me let me stop sharing this. I forgot to pull it up. Let's see, stop sharing. Let me go here real quick. Give me one second. There's one little area in the engage manual I need you guys to look at. So I'm pulling it up right now. Just give me one second for that. And let me share my screen again. All right, you should be able to see this now. Now, most of the stuff that we just talked about, of course, it's in the uh, Engage Manual. In the lymphatic system, you see the functions. And I, I encourage you to read down through there, all right? 
Um, they talk about the different trunks. You have to identify these things on that model. Um, but let me go down to, and they got sections on the temp T cells and B cells, this chart. I do not have a chart of the antibodies in my chapter, but I'd like for you to know the five classes of these antibodies. So there's five classes of antibodies that the B cells make. And you don't have to memorize all of these percentages, but just learn what their main roles are that you see in this box over here. So the IgGs are the most numerous, by the way. They also are uh, the antibody in the blood group that serve as the, the anti-RH antibodies that I mentioned with hemolytic disease of a newborn. These antibodies have the ability to cross the placenta. Now, so while the mom's pregnant, some of her antibodies, the IgGs, are crossing the placenta and it helps aid in uh, giving a little bit of immunity to the baby, but we don't want these made. Remember the anti-RH antibodies? You don't want those. Um, the IgAs are secreted in breast milk. It's in your sweat, your tears. So just read down through these things right here in your saliva. Um, same thing with IgM, the D, and the E. Now the E is the one that you really hate if you have allergies. They're loaded down on inflammatory cells like uh, mast cells and basophils, and when we come in contact with uh, allergens and they're binding and activating these antibodies against these cells, we have a massive inflammatory response. So ultimately, uh, all of these antibodies have their own roles and aid in protecting us from pathogens in some form or fashion. So just know the little bit that's written here, don't memorize the percentages. I don't, I'm not gonna ask you the percentages, all right? All right, so before I stop sharing the screen, does anybody have any questions with that? Pretty straightforward, huh?